Hello, everybody. It's great to be here in Calgary tonight. I'm Ann Dowsett Johnston. You know, there's a joke they tell about a writer who goes up to the pearly gates on a really, really busy day, and um, she stands in line for about two hours and gets really tired of it and goes to the front of the line and says to God, God, I'm not sure whether I'm going to heaven or hell, but do you think I could just take a sneak peek at hell? I think that's where I'm headed. And, um, and God says, sure, first door on the right. So she takes a wander down the hall and she opens the door and she sees her worst nightmare. She sees um, a whole room full of writers chained to their desks, clocks going round and round and round, sweat pouring from their brow. They've all missed their deadlines. She walks back to God and she says, God, do you think I could take a sneak peek at heaven? And he says, sure, lots of time. She walks down, first door on the left, opens the door and sees the same damn thing. <laughs> Clock going round and round, writers change to their desk. Clearly, they've all missed their deadlines. She goes back to God and she says, God, I don't know. I don't see much difference between heaven and hell. And he says, oh, my dear, there's a very big difference. In heaven, the writers get published. <laughs> that was my heavenly truth in the last year. My first book got published, and it was heavenly. I have to tell you, I was interviewed all around the world, and I thought it was just great. That was the good news. The bad news was I outed myself as an alcoholic to the entire world. Not only an alcoholic, but the poster girl of modern alcoholism. And by that I mean I was professional, I was highly educated, I was high functioning, and I was high bottom, which means I didn't crack up my car, I didn't go to jail, I didn't lose my family, but I was an al alcoholic. And as I did interviews all around the world, I was always asked the same question, and I came to see it as the, the rudest thing you could ask me. And it was, why did you want to write this book? And I really read it as, are you crazy? Don't you know you'll never work again? And how much did you drink? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'm not crazy. Um, I'm not crazy. I think our secrets keep us sick. Um, I'm working these days. And how much did I drink? Well, a lot more than I should have, and probably a lot less than you're thinking right now. <laughs> um, I got sober more than six years ago, and I can tell you, first year sobriety is not for the faint of heart. And it's not for the faint of heart because we live in an alcogenic culture. Walk into any social setting, any possible social setting, and the first thing you're going to be asked, even tonight, is red or white. Know your wines, you're sophisticated. Know your vodkas, you're hip. Know your coolers, you're young and female. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, women like me and women like the women I was are drinking more than they ever have. I knew I wasn't alone. As a journalist who spent 30 years at McLean's Magazine, I clipped tons of, of clippings and knew that, uh, that I couldn't possibly be the only one, and I was right. The truth is this is global. The richer the country, the narrower the gap between men and women and their alcohol consumption. And that's just the way it is all around the world. Men have always consumed more than women everywhere, but globally men are flatlining or even dipping right now. Women are on the rise. And in the UK, which I call the Lindsay Lohan of the international set, <laughs> women have caught up with men getting end-stage liver disease in their 20s. This is confounding epidemiologists all around the world. So the question is why? And that's the question that I really asked in my book, Drink. The question is why, and I think the number one reason is alcohol has become the modern woman, woman's steroid, enabling her to do the heavy lifting in a really confounding world, and, and you know how this plays. You come home from the office completely tuckered out with a bag full of groceries, you go straight to the chopping board, you pour yourself a glass of wine, you feel your shoulders unhitched from your earlobes just a little bit, knowing that you have a whole evening ahead of overseeing home homework and probably tons of email. It's a decompression tool. That's number one. Number two is self-medication. 
Um, women are 40% more likely to suffer from depression than men, higher anxiety, and it's a numbing tool. That's obvious. Um, but women also are drinking because they can. They can and they're being marketed to. And this is what I call the pinking of the market. Walk into any alcohol outfit and you'll see it right there. Skinny girl cocktails, mummy juice wine, girls night out, out wine, cupcake wine, and if you're in the United States, yes, even happy bitch wine. These aren't manly drinks. <laughs> so I went to the experts a couple of years ago and said, um, what's happening? When did, this, when did this evolve? When did the pinking of the market start? And I heard the most amazing story, and it goes like this. Sometime in the 1990s, the spirits guys, and they were mostly guys from the tobacco industry, um, they'd migrated there, looked at beer, and beer was cleaning their clocks. Beer was fun, beer was sports, beer was entertainment. And they looked around, did market segmentation in the world and realized all the Johnny Walker drinkers were dying out. And they realized that there was one group that was underperforming in, this, in the world, and it was an entire gender. And so they took a great gamble. They took a great gamble on the Alka Pop, those sweet, fizzy, um, prepackaged rum or uh, vodka-infused drinks, Mike's Hard Lemonade, and so on. And they threw it out in the market to see what would happen. And it was an entire success. Um, yeah, it hit the market. These are what I called cocktails with training wheels, starter drinks, chick beer. And the idea was to steer high school girls away from beer. And it was an experiment that totally paid off. Go to any Canadian campus or North American campus right now and you'll find young men and women who are playing drinking games. And he's drinking beer. She's two-thirds the size. She's drinking vodka or tequila shots. She probably hasn't eaten um, before the evening because it's a date. She's at a distinct disadvantage. And we all know that alcohol is the number one date rape drug. Um, this uh, generation is not slowing down. They're not slowing down in their 20s, and they're not slowing down in their 30s. And why we care about that and need to care about that is that in Canada, 60% plus of all babies are born to the group that is actually on the rise in terms of binge drinking at, at the steepest level, and that's the age group between 24 and 36. Um, so this is, this is a confounding and troubling statistic, and FASD numbers are on the rise. Um, I'm not trying to rain on your parade or be a killjoy. If you can drink with impunity, good for you, lucky you, as far as I'm concerned. But it, if you're f female, know that safe drinking guidelines say that you can drink two, 10 drinks a week and never more than two in one evening. Think about that. If you're female, know that 15% of all breast cancer cases are limited to, or excuse me, linked to alcohol consumption. And that alcohol is a carcinogen linked to 200 diseases and cancers. The truth is we know very little about our favorite drug. More than 80% of us drink in Canada, 15 and up. In fact, the average age of starting in, in the Maritimes is 13 years old. But we remain blissfully ignorant about this favorite drug of ours. We hear a lot about the profits from alcohol sales in Canada, but very little about the costs with emergency room visits and policing and so on. Two years ago, a really smart Albertan took a hard look at, the, at those numbers and did the math. And it, no surprise, the costs far outweighed the profits. So my question is simple. Are we having an adult conversation about the cost of risky drinking in Canada? I think not. A public health dialogue? Absolutely not. The truth is, when it comes to alcohol, our values are really fuzzy. We know all about the downsides of trans fats and tanning beds. But we like to think of a glass of red wine as the next best thing to dark chocolate and vitamin D. Good for your health, to your health. Are we having that adult conversation? I don't think so. In fact, I know we're not, and the costs are high. After tobacco, alcohol costs the most harm in Canada, 14.6 billion a year. So I'd like to leave you with this one image. 
Let's say there was a frog pond where many of the frogs were sterile and growing unseemly warts. Would you say, send in the fertility experts and surgeons? Or would you say, as one wise person said, maybe there's something in the water? Tonight I'm here to tell you there's something in the water. Thank you.